joining today. So this is the first of a series of webinars that we're going to host getting progressively more specific. But today, we're going to start out at a really high level intro of Glue. And we will try and keep it under 30 minutes. And at the end, if you have any questions, or even along the way, feel free to put your questions in the chat, and we'll try and get to them. So, so the goal is to give an overview of Glue, to talk about our open source strategy, which we adjusted a little bit at the end of, of last year, and to give you an idea of how to get started with Glue. Um, and, and, you know, probably, you know, in a half an hour, we can only do so much, but we can give you at least some hints on, on where to start and, and, and um, which components you might want to look at. So for, for those of you who don't know, Glue is, is, a, is a platform for SSO. And we're known for the Glue server, which is a flagship product. That's, that's the, the component that authenticates people and issues tokens and identity assertions. But Glue has a number of other components, including um, Glue Gateway, which is a, like a fancy web proxy that allows you to control security to websites and APIs. CASA, which is a self-service portal that enables users to enroll and delete credentials, two-factor credentials, or link their accounts with, with social networks or IDPs. And even Superglue are, are mobile to FA app. So, so really Glue's a whole platform of components that, that helps you deploy single sign-on and multi-factor authentication and to control access to, to APIs and resources. So we're not huge. We're about 35 people. In June, we will um, be hitting 11 years. And while there's a lot of glue out there in the world, we're estimating around 3,000 deployments or so, uh, the, the business of Glue is serving large enterprise customers, uh, of which we have more than 50. And we also have a great partner network. So uh, if you're in a country other than the US, we, we uh, have a number of partners internationally who can help you deploy and configure Glue. So not all of the identity platforms out there are open source. So a lot of people ask us, why are we open source? Why, 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 does this, why do we think this security product is better off open source? And first of all, we believe that trust is important, that nothing builds trust like source code. And the ability of, of, of our customers to actually see what's in there is important for high assurance um, enterprise applications where we just feel like well, the transparency of the code is, a, is an important feature. But the, the main reason I would say why we're open source and have been for 10 years has to do with, with quality. We, do, we think that the open source development methodology is the best way to write software. And that it's actually been shown that the open source as a de development methodology leads to less bugs and in general, if you look at some of the the greatest software out there today, it is open source, and we, and we we just feel like it's the best way to write code. And and finally, of course, the community, the ability to get our software out there and to get used in a lot of ways that maybe we didn't think of, and to get feedback from the community and to build the community around the Glue server, we think that that's really key for us driving innovation in the in the future. And, and and also um, increasing the number of people who know it sort of makes it it's better for everybody. It increases the supply of engineers out there. And um, so, so Glue is not, while we're an important part of the ecosystem, we don't have to be the whole ecosystem. There can be other companies and other organizations and developers out there who know Glue. And that's really important to us. So, there's a lot of ways to um, structure your open source company. And I have a podcast called Open Source Underdog. Some of you might know. I interviewed 
uh, currently 42 co uh, companies about how they use open source as part of their business model. And we spent a lot of time thinking about this. And the, the direction that we've chosen is to open source all of the functional code of Glue. So people say, always ask us, like, what's in the enterprise version that's not in the community version? Well, there's nothing, the, the, there's feature parity between the versions. There's nothing in, in the enterprise edition that you won't find in the community edition. And for us, open source means it's not just that the source code is, is, is public and Apache 2 license and available on GitHub, but also that the binaries are open source. That includes the, the packages, the RPMs and DEBs. Um, also the Linux containers um, are, are all open source. So uh, we feel that Glue is a complicated platform. And if we just put the code out there, but we never, but we didn't support it publicly, that it wouldn't be um, usable by the community. So we have a commitment to support the the product, and so support.glue.org. We answer questions from the community and from customers. Although, if you are a supported customer, then you get an SLA um, on 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 a response time. Um, you can also post private supports. So there are some differences between community support and and our enterprise support, uh, but um, but we do still answer questions from the community. Um, we hope that the, all the community helps us in that effort and helps their uh, fellow community members. But um, but we do monitor support um, pretty pretty closely. So what do we actually sell? Well, there. there first of all, we sell support. Um, so the VIP support subscription is a per component subscription that allows you to get support on things like Glue Gateway or um, OpenID or SAML or social login. So e each component at Glue, um, you can buy a support um, contract on so you can get the support that you need for your deployment. And we also sell um, deployment tools. So we have two ways that we can deploy highly available topologies of Glue servers. One is called Cluster Manager, and that is a way to deploy in a highly available cluster of glue servers using the the RPMs and the or the DEBs, the VM packages, basically, and it's it's a deployment tool, meaning that you could use Cluster Manager to deploy your your cluster and then turn it off and 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 you'd be fine. So it's not really in, needed at runtime, although people do leave it running because it gives you some nice information about the topology, but. Um, um, but it, it's we found that customers had a lot of questions about deploying clusters, although Glue is stateless, and you could set up LDAP multi-master replication. Like that, that's mostly what people think about when deploying clusters. But there's actually more to it. There's key rotation. There's centralized logging. Um, there's monitoring. So when you put all that, um, there's some file system replication. So. When you deploy a, a production HA cluster, um, we found that Cluster Manager really made that a lot easier, where we could use this tool and deploy clusters in about an hour with the customer. Um, and then we have customers who are interested in containers and Kubernetes and Helm. And this we're very supportive of this um, deployment strategy. Um, we maybe even secretly wish that there that everyone would go containers, um, although we don't see that happening for um, you know for today. Um, but containers give us a lot of advantages, including the security advantage of having each service running in its own container, and elasticity or auto scaling is a huge advantage for containers, and. Just multi-cloud deployments. There's there's so many like advantages of containers that we're really big fans. But we found that actually, um, although we the containers themselves um, for the services are open source, that how you deploy these containers and get them to work, um, i.e. the orchestration, is tricky. And we spent um, several years really developing an orchestration strategy using Kubernetes and Helm, and we've built some scripts, some shell scripts on top of this so that you don't have to run a million command line um, 
um, tools to get it all to work. So we, we bundle together all of those assets, the Kubernetes YAML files, the Helm files, the shell scripts, and we call that deployment of Glue Enterprise Edition. Um, so it's all the same underlying binaries, but it's just sort of a different deployment strategy. And that and that, and those assets are licensed. Um, and the other goal of providing two distributions for high availability is that we can more easily support these cluster strategies. So if something goes wrong in in production and you need help in your cluster, if you're using one of the strategies, one of the tools that, that we um, built for cluster deployment, it's easier for us to support um, the issues that might ar arise, um, especially emergency issues that might, might arise um, in, that, in that cluster. So um, just to review, what do we sell? We sell support and we sell these two um, deployment strategies. Okay, so now getting back to the, where do you start? So I always recommend starting with community edition um, because it's just really easy and it, it's functionally complete. It gives you all the pieces that, that you might be looking for. And and so there's a there's actually a Docker Compose um, quick start that we have, we call it test drive. And, and that's a good place to start um, or just start with one of the VM packages, apt install, Glue server or Yelm install Glue server, run setup, answer a couple of questions, and you'll have your your initial Glue server up up and running. And I always think that you know even if you're really interested in containers, um, sometimes separating your deployment from your functional testing can be useful, and that way you can focus on one at a time. Um, because the functional, like the or I should say the deployment issues, won't impact how you develop the apps. And so maybe it's maybe I would recommend um, deploying your um, your Glue server. Just get it up and running. Write your apps, and then if it makes sense for you and you want to scale it out, then it's time to look at um, how do I cluster and and how do I implement um, containers. So Glue is really good at 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 multi-factor authentication. It's one of the big drivers for our business, and. So out of the box, we support OTP, SMS using Twilio. We support FIDO U2F and FIDO2. We have a mobile app called Superglue. And we support some commercial um, um, services like Duo Security. Um, so, uh, so out of the box, you can um, quickly um, deploy OTP, or I'm sorry, quickly deploy um, two-factor authentication and um, the easiest one, I always like enable uh, FIDO U2F because um, you just literally click a button and, and you can support that one. So I always find that that's an easy one. OTP is also pretty easy to implement. Um, so it, one of the tools that we're now shipping included with, with the Glue server is called CASA. And we used to call this tool Credential Manager, but we renamed it CASA because we wanted something more generic. So what CASA is, is it's a self-service portal for managing your credentials and for handling account linking. And so if you think about password reset, so if you lose your password, everyone knows what to do, but what happens when you lose your two-factor token? Um, so you need a way to remove that token and enroll a new one. Um, Google does a really good job in this area, and we looked at Google and Microsoft and GitHub and some of the other services that we thought were doing a good service, and we built an app that, that provided um, this type of um, functionality for two-factor credential management. And then we realized that cost could be useful for some other things, like maybe you want to revoke a, a refresh token, or maybe you want to link your account with a social network like Twitter or Facebook. And so we built, we, we extended CASA to um, use plugins. So customers could write their own functionality. Um, and we're hoping to coalesce an ecosystem around CASA plugins so that as people um, um, implement their own um, plugins for maybe a 2FA service that they like, that they can um, share these tools. But I think CASA is an important um, piece of the puzzle for 2FA because you need to think about how do you validate these credentials, and that happens in the Glue server. But the other piece is 
how do you enable end users to manage their credentials? And what we found at Glue is that while most customers would agree that the security of passwords is terrible, and what what's really um, preventing customers from rolling out two-factor authentication is that the deployability of passwords is still good versus these other tools. And we feel that cost is an important piece of the puzzle in terms of making pass um, two-factor authentication more deployable and overcoming that challenge of how do you roll out um, um, two-factor authentication to your end users without generating tons of calls to the support desk about when these new types of credentials get lost. So um, I see some of the questions, and I'm going to address these questions um, when I when I get through the slides. So thank you for the questions. The so okay, so now you've deployed your Glue server, or maybe you've uh, you've um, you've um, enabled some two-factor authentication, and now you have to think about what types of applications am I going to support? And I always recommend that um, deploying your a central identity provider is really a good thing to do early on um, because it can help you choose which applications you might want to procure. So for example, if you're um, if you want to to uh, consolidate on OpenID Connect, when you're evaluating a SaaS application, their ability to support Connect might might be a favorable feature for you to, to consider. So um, but in general, the, the strategy at Glue is that applications should um, really um, use open standards for authentication like SAML and o OpenID. And you especially want to avoid the client ever seeing the password. So if you're seeing the client here is a website or mobile application. So the, the trust model is, is that the Glue server or the IDP generically displays the login page. So the, the IDP sees the password, but if the end application, the website, let's say, sees that password, what's to stop the website from, from caching that, that password and replaying it later? And then how do we really know it's the end user? So, um, so um, not surprisingly at Glue, we're advocating for, for open standards um, as, the, as the interface for, for applications. The, um, we have a new product called Glue Gateway. Um, so this is just one of many ways that you can integrate applications, but it's been a popular strategy to put a web server or a proxy in front of your application. And in this web server, you enforce security. And this pattern can be used for both um, back to connect back channel connections from the website to APIs, and can also be used as a front channel web proxy. So, um, Glue Gateway allows you to enforce policies like what OAuth tokens are required in order to call a certain API, and or even what um, um, what UMA scopes are required in order to traverse to a certain section of the website, or perhaps what authentication mechanisms are required in order to get to a certain part of the website. Um, for example, maybe there is a for you let the user authenticate with password, but when they go to their payment mechanisms, you want to use two-factor authentication. So maybe when they go to the slash payments, you know, part of the site, you you implement a policy for for two FA. So these are some of the things you can do with Glue Gateway. Um, we've we've found that also Glue Gateway enables us to provide end-to-end -end support. So we're supporting both the the web um, component and and the um, and the IDP. Um, it's not the only, uh, any standard OpenID or SAML client works with Glue, so it's not like you have to use Glue Gateway, but we felt that customers, some of our customers wanted um, um, this type of end-to-end -end support. And um, also, it's it's one of the best uh, ways to implement an UMA resource server. So UMA is a new profile of OAuth that allows you to interact with the user to get their consent or to get other information that you might need. And so with the Glue Gateway, you can implement the RS. Um, so that's the thing that protects the APIs. The Glue server is the AS, or authorization server, the thing that issues the tokens. And so 
To implement UMA, if you're using Glue Gateway and Glue Server, you only have to implement your client. So it can be a quick way to, to deploy UMA. So at Glue, um, we are serving primarily our enterprise customers or large customers, and we get a lot of questions about performance. And we found that this is one of the areas where containers is really um, performing well for us. So for one of the things to consider um, is, and how big is your user base? So everyone's gonna ask you that, um, and that's an important piece of data to understand. But actually what might be even more important is to know, is to understand the concurrency. If you have a billion users who never log in, you'd be surprised you could probably run that on relatively low resources. So the concurrency or transactions per second is really an important consideration. And the more concurrency you need, the more horizontal scalability um, that you need to achieve. Um, so one of the things that we've worked really hard on at Glue is introducing an alternate backend. Now, um, we love LDAP at Glue. We started, LDAP was um, our primary database or uh, persistence engine for years. But about three years ago, we started working on Couchbase. Um, Couchbase is a JSON document um, um, database. And it's um, especially, uh, we found that the horizontal scalability of Couchbase was really great. Um, if if you need a lot of concurrency and you need to split up the data into multiple servers, this is hard to do with LDAP. You need to install a proxy. You need to um, have a really good LDAP admin who knows what they're doing. Um, adding split further splitting the data requires, you know, exporting LDIF and updating your proxy rule. So we found that horizontal scaling with LDAP was challenging, whereas Couchbase, there was a lot of automation in the scaling where you could just say, okay, I have more disks that are available and Couchbase was automatically doing this distribution of data for you. Also, Couchbase has separated the index query and data service. So we could scale the index service. We can add more compute to the index service without, without having to touch the data service. And that gave us a more important scalability, um, horizontal scalability. Um, ultimately, we want to be able to algorithmically define, okay, you have this many transactions um, per second, you need this topology of database. And with Couchbase, um, we've been able to, uh, recently we did 5,000 transactions per second, but we really feel like you just tell us what performance you need and we can plug that into a spreadsheet and tell you what database backend that you need and how many glue servers and how many, what, what topology of Couchbase servers you need and we can get there. So it gave us a lot of confidence to really be able to support any, any amount of scalability. And um, of course, the, this type of horizontal scalability is easier to do with Kubernetes. Um, while, while you can do it with VMs, um, provisioning VMs just takes longer. And with Kubernetes, we, we, we can scale up and down um, almost instantaneously. And this really um, ends up saving a lot of money because um, a lot of our requirements are bursty. So if you think about um, tax day, maybe um, nobody, everyone waits till the last minute to file their taxes. So during throughout the year, you don't have an even distribution of of traffic. You basically have everybody trying to like access the service on you know the same couple of days before the event. And so what happens is is if you have to scale up your your infrastructure ahead of time, you end up having a lot of servers that are sitting around doing nothing most of the year. And with Kubernetes, we're able to achieve auto scaling. And this is this saves a huge amount of money because although cloud computing is great, it's still expensive. And so, um, so if you can just in time provision um, the compute um, and, and other cloud resources that you need, um, really it's, 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 it's very cost effective. Um, so yeah, so elasticity has been um, um, really we before couch before Kubernetes and containers, um, there was just no no way to do it, um, and then Kubernetes has has really made it um, easier and possible. Um, also, multi-cloud deployments is another um, using perhaps your private cloud plus a public cloud provider 
um, um, platform to um, build a highly available multi-region um, resilient network is another use case we, we really like for, for containers. So I think that does, the, I know um, this has been a lot of just talking at you um, in this webinar. So um, so I'm gonna um, handle some of the questions I have now um, that have accumulated, but feel free to plug your questions in. Um, we have a couple more minutes. Um, the first question I got, will Glue work with an Nginx reverse proxy server? So um, the answer to that question is yes. Um, we've um, So when you ship Glue Community Edition, we include an Apache web server as, as the to front end the Java web services, but you can replace that with any server. And over the years, we've seen people use um, Nginx and um, HAProxy and Apache and other uh, commercial load balancing services like Amazon um, um, as a load balancer service and other, other load balancers. So um, you can actually, um, so we never want the Java um, um, and endpoints to be directly exposed to the internet. We always want some type of web server to terminate the SSL um, to and then to proxy back to those Java web services. Um, the reason for that is if there was ever a web service um, security hole, we would never want the private keys to be potentially visible in memory. So having um, your SSL keys being compromised in the web server is bad, but it's not as bad as your federation keys being compromised. So, um, so that's why, just from a security perspective, we always want some type of internet-facing web server there. Um, but as long as um, um, you know it's it's terminating the SSL and proxying pro properly, um, you can use any any web server there. And uh, maybe the only other caveat I'll mention there is that if you're doing um, um, uh, mutual TLS with the with either smart cards or browser certificates. Um, just remember that the that the web server there is is actually performing the mutual TLS authentication, and you have to make sure you configure it properly so the Glue server can um, access that information um, from from the web server. So um, the second question I had is web and mobile apps, but what about machine to machine? Well, actually, OAuth is fantastic for machine-to-machine -machine security. Um, when, when actually, I wouldn't say machine-to-machine. -machine, I would say a piece of software calling another piece of software. And in in OAuth, we have this great um, entity for a um, a piece of software called a client. So an OAuth client is really a piece of software. And there's a grant um, in OAuth called the Client Credential Grant. Um, and that's where a client um, goes to the token endpoint and says, give me a token. And then it uses that token to call an API. Um, so that's the pattern I would look to for machine to machine. Um, in the Glue server, we have a, um, a script called the introspection script that allows you to modify the access um, um, token to put information in that might be useful for access control. And so you can do quite a lot um, uh, with OAuth access tokens. Um, and maybe one last piece of advice I'd have about machine-to-machine -machine communication is um, use private key authentication at the token endpoint. Um, because um, this is sort of a best practice for a long time is that in, when, the, when, you, when this piece of software registers for client credentials with the Glue server, um, it can it can use a public key. Um, it can register a public key and then use that. Um, um, or there's a an authentication flow um, built into the Glue server for private key authentication, um, which is a challenge response protocol. So we can um, strongly authenticate this client, this piece of software, and also it's asymmetric. Um, so I think rather than using API key and secret, which is a shared secret, a symmetric secret. Um, better to use asymmetric um, secrets um, and use private key authentication for your for your software. Um, I had um, a question about um, how Glue is similar to another product. Um, I'm not familiar with this product, so I, I can't do that comparison. Um, I don't. For, unfortunately, there's a lot, I don't know all the products out there, um, but we'll have to I'll have to defer on that one. Um, 
So question about um, um, how wide is your service? Is it completely focused on setting up the glue servers? Are you helping companies centralize authorization authentication and set up good strategy and work um, and and work that out in a glue setup? Um, so glue is our primary business is supporting the glue server. Um, so we have services partners. So we don't we would prefer not to undertake professional services projects, but to engage um, local partners who can help the end customers, and we support them. Um, so there are exceptions to that in certain cases, but but in general, we try and um, we try as hard as possible to send services to um, to partners. Um, what tools does Glue have to interact with existing user data? So so. Um, one of the components of Glue is called um, OxTrust, and that's the admin um, interface for Glue, but it also supports the SCIM endpoint. Um, SCIM is a JSON REST um, API for user management. So there's a slash users endpoint, and you can post to add a user, you can get to search users, you can, um, you can modify users and delete users. And so that's our preferred interface for um, if an application has to manage user data, we would prefer they, um, that they use the SCIM um, endpoint because the SCIM endpoint is a high-level interface that is um, an abstraction layer over the database. Remember, Glue supports both LDAP and Couchbase, and so we prefer that there be no tight bundling between the database because maybe you're using LDAP today, but you want to use Couchbase tomorrow. You don't want to have to change your code. Um, um, CASA, but Glue is not an identity management tool. Um, we're a consumer of identity data. Um, so in general, we'd like to see workflows around add user, edit user, delete user happening in some external process and then communicating to Glue um, that, that updated latest, latest information. Um, okay, and last question, I think we're gonna have to wrap it because I see we're, we're right, at, right at the time. Would Glue be a good fit for minimal authentication and authorization needs, like simple authentication for mobile, uh, multiple web clients, OAuth2 authorization for machine-to-machine, -machine, social login? Um, oh, so I think, so we see, you know, with the 3,000 or so deployments out there, there's actually quite a number of, uh, quite a range of businesses from small businesses to large businesses using Glue for all sorts of stuff. It is super easy to get started with it. You know, apt install Glue server, answer some questions, and it's up and running. And then you can point your OpenID Connect or SAML applications at it. And we see quite a bit in the, um, um, you know, existing open source applications that support these protocols, um, like uh, OnlyOffice or Rocket Chat or uh, WordPress or, or Drupal, things like that. Um, so, or even custom applications that need OpenID Connect um, um, server. So we, we tried to make it easy to deploy and operate. Um, and once, um, so um, it's pretty easy to implement two-factor. So you can do all that. Um, and I, I don't think it's overkill. Um, we, 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 are, we do recognize that customers love SaaS, identity SaaS services. And we're, um, we do feel like, you know, if that's, if, if you can use a SaaS service, you probably should. And that glue is left over for companies who have some reason why um, they can't, which is which could be security or privacy or um, scalability or some custom requirements. So there's still a lot of reasons why you might want to operate your own your own service, um, or or so. Um, so, um, but we you know given that. Um, I think SaaS services are so popular, we realize there's a high bar for usability. And we try and, once you've made that decision that you're going to operate this identity platform, we try and make that as easy as possible um, for you to do. Um, so I, I think, I think um, give it a shot. And if you get stuck, register on support.glue.org, um, post your questions there, and, um, and hopefully um, uh, we can help or the community can help. Um, Last question about the presentation. Um, so all of these webinars are going to be posted on the website. Um, they might be behind a form, but they'll be available. And um, please tune in. Um, we're going to go. This one was really like high level. We're going to go in, into some more detail um, about how to do specific things like use Glue Gateway, use um, configure Casa, 
um, and stuff like that. So um, please stay tuned. Um, and thank you, everybody, very much for, for joining and for sticking with us. Okay.